praise the Lord. I praise the name of the Lord for those who are faithfully coming every time. And I pray that your coming will not be in vain in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for your love. I thank you for revealing yourself to us so that we we'll live a profitable, progressive life even at this time, at this time of probation, so that when we see you on the final day, everything we have done for your glory, everything we have done in love, everything we have done to bring sinners into the kingdom will be rewarded on that final day. We are asking, O oh Lord, will not be tired, will not be weak, will not be weary, will go on pursuing and reaching out to souls as you want us to do every time in Jesus' name. Lord, we commit ourselves and we consecrate everything we have. We will preach the gospel. We will declare your truth. We'll bring sinners into the kingdom and point them to Calvary and point them to the Savior. And I pray as they come, they'll be saved and transformed. They become new creatures and citizens in your kingdom in Jesus' name. Lord, help us to move on. Help us to continue. Help us not to look back. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. And the people of God said, Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. You'll find from the Apostle Paul that his consecration, commitment, and yieldedness, steadfastness in the preaching of the gospel was not something that he felt, maybe I can do it, maybe I will not do it, maybe I will continue, maybe I will not continue. He said, I preach the gospel. And yet he says, with all that consecration, with all that commitment, and with all that steadfastness in preaching the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. I cannot compare myself to that other apostle and to that other minister and to that other steward and then glory over them and say I'm doing much more than they're doing. It says there's no comparison. Why? Because necessity is laid upon me. It says heaven has laid a necessity upon me. There is nothing else to do. There is nothing else I can do. If I try to do any other thing, it will not succeed because God will blow on it and I will be disappointed. I have this necessity laid upon me. In fact, it says, yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Why will Paul be telling us that? And why will the apostle be emphasizing that this is a necessity laid upon me? Because he was using himself as an example. That is the same commitment we have, is the same consecration we ought to have, that we should understand preaching the gospel for you, for me, and for everyone is a necessity. In fact, if we abandon the gospel, if we set aside the gospel and we then pursue other things of the world, we will be disappointed because woe is unto each one. If we publicize not, if we proclaim not, if we preach not the gospel. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 16, it says, Wherefore, I I beseech you be ye followers of me it says when i talk about necessity when i talk about the compulsion when i talk about the very fact that there's nothing else i can do that this is the way of the lord and the will of the lord and the commandment of the lord for me is not just for me i push that to you to every christian 
it says wherefore i beseech you be ye followers of me in first corinthians chapter 11 looking at verse 1 first corinthians chapter 11 reading from verse 1 it says be ye followers of me even as i also i am of christ if you remember the consuming concern and the consuming zeal of the lord jesus christ is that he said i am come to seek and to save that which was lost men are lost in sin and men are lost in iniquity and jesus christ came to seek them to bring them to repentance he says i am come to lead them sinners to repentance and he says paul the apostle said you follow me and as i am following christ christ's zeal and christ's concern and the compulsion on christ is that he will save the laws and that is the same that he has for you and for me today and i pray that this ministry and this assignment and this duty and this responsibility of preaching the gospel we will take it as christ took it in jesus name and we will pursue it as the apostle paul pursued it every one of us without exception in jesus name i wanted to hear an amen in Philippians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 17. Philippians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 17. Brethren, all the believers now, all the children of God, those who claim they are members of the family of God, it says, brethren, be ye followers together of me. You see that? It says, it's not something we'll push to Paul the Apostle. That's Paul the Apostle. That's his own commitment. That's his own consecration. And that's that is the soul responsibility. He says, everyone, brethren, be ye followers of me, and then mark them which walk so as she have us for an example. And you look at me, Paul the Apostle said, and Timothy and Titus and Silas and Luke and all the other companions of Paul the Apostle that committed themselves to preaching the gospel and to preaching the word and to getting people into the kingdom. He says, all of us men and women, all of us those who are born again, all of us who are children of God, here is what we ought to follow. Here is what you need to dedicate ourselves to. Here is what we need to commit ourselves to. Be ye followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Don't follow the lazy ones. Don't follow the negligent ones. Don't follow the people who turn their back against the will of God and the assignment the Lord has given us. The people you are to mark and the people you are to target and the people that are to be your example and your hero they are the people that have us as example and then we're following after that's why tonight as we look at this passage in first Corinthians chapter 9 verses 16 to 23 we're talking on preaching the gospel by all possible means all means possible we do it by personal contact. We do it by reaching out to the sinners in our community everywhere. And we do it by literature. And we do it by media, uh, social media, anything we can use. We do that preaching the gospel by all possible means. We are divided the message to three parts. Number one, the prevailing, compelling commission to preach the gospel. The, the commission to preach the gospel, that compelling commission to preach the gospel, the prevailing compelling commission. That means this is the prevailing purpose of your life and the prevailing passion of your life and the prevailing pursuit of your life that you will not allow any other thing to come to the front bottom. You will not allow any other thing to take the precedence and to take preeminence or to be prominent in your life you will make the commission to preach the gospel 
a compelling prevailing commission of your life that you commit yourself to that day is lost when you have not reached out with the gospel to a lost soul that day or that week is lost when you have not committed yourself and you cannot remember the passion you cannot remember the pursuit you cannot remember the excitement you have in preaching the gospel and making somebody know that Jesus and Jesus only is the Savior. Point number two, the purposeful, convincing, consecration in pursuing his goal. That's the goal of Christ, his goal. And if you're a child of God, Christ lives in you and you live in Christ and his goal becomes your goal. His passion becomes your passion. His pursuit becomes your pursuit. His interest becomes your interest. And you are committed to that goal. And there's no other goal, maybe making money or going into business or having this or having that. There's no other goal that competes with this goal of preaching the gospel, preaching the word to the lost and bringing them into the kingdom. And you consecrate yourself to that. You you are convinced you are consecrated you are not wondering am i committed am i consecrated am i for it am i not for it there's no doubt in your heart there's no doubt in the heart of your neighbors there's no doubt in the members of your family that this is your consecration it is public it is visible it is practical it is well known here is a believer that he is convincingly committed to the preaching of the gospel and it is purposeful it is not just to fulfill all righteousness is to bring sinners out of their sin out of darkness into the marvelous light of the gospel of the lord jesus christ point number two the purposeful convincing consecration in pursuing his goal point number three the proper consuming concern for the people of god after they come into the kingdom after they are saved then we need to have consent for the people of god that they be discipled you follow up on them you raise them up you you help them and you feed them so that they'll not remain new converts all their lives babies all their lives but they will be people who are growing in the lord the proper consuming concern for the people of god we're coming to point number one and point number one is the prevailing compelling commission to preach the gospel we're back to first corinthians chapter 9 verse 16 first corinthians chapter 9 we're reading from verse 16 it says for though i preach the gospel he said you know my life and you know my commitment i preach the gospel corinthians there's no doubt in your heart when i came to you i didn't get involved with any other thing i preach the gospel and he said you can check up every other place i've gone thessalonica or ephesus or any other place and the province of galicia i preach the gospel that's the compelling commission that i have and he says though i preach the gospel i have nothing to glory of for necessity is laid upon me yea woe is me if i preach not the gospel why did he say that because of the commission the lord had given him look at acts chapter 9 in verse 6 acts chapter 9 we're reading from verse 6 it says and he trembling and astonished said lord what will thou have me to do at this time now you remember the story he was going to damascus 
it was going to persecute the Christians. It was going to knock on their doors and find them in every house. And anyone he found, whether a man or a woman, whether young or old, he will arrest that one for being a Christian and for being a disciple of the Lord. And then before he got to Damascus, the Lord brought him down. From the horse he was riding, from the chariot he was traveling with, he became blinded and he had the voice of Jesus Christ, so, so, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And then the Lord replied, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And he surrendered his life to the Lord. He said, I've been in ignorance. I did all that in ignorance, persecuting the people, thinking they are not following the religion of our fathers. And as he surrendered himself to the Lord, look at that verse 6. He now wanted to know, what am I going to do? I cannot go and persecute them anymore. I'm part of them now. What will I do? And then he said, and the Lord said unto him, Arise and go uh, into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. There is a must in your life now, what thou must do. There is a necessity that is laid upon your life now, what thou must do. There is a commission, there is a duty, there is a responsibility laid squarely on your shoulders now, what thou must do. Look at verse 15. It says in verse 15, But the Lord said unto him, Unto Ananias, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel. He is a chosen vessel. The Lord laid his hands on him now. And the Lord said, you have just one thing to do for the rest of your life. Until the very last day, till the very last breath of your life, you now have something to do. You are a chosen vessel to bear my name to bear my name that's the name of jesus to bear my name as savior to bear my name as redeemer to bear my name as the only one that has come to save them and to take them out of their evil and bring them into the kingdom you'll bear my name before the gentiles number one before the kings, the rulers, number two, and before the children of Israel, number three. Look at verse 16. It says, For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my sake. He will suffer for it. Not because I'm punishing him, but because the people who are blinded by hatred, because the people who reject and rebel against the word of salvation, because they will not understand, and their misunderstanding the gospel will make them persecute Paul, the apostle, who is proclaiming that gospel. I will show him how great things he must suffer for my sake. But that will not deter him. That will not slow him down. That will not hinder him because necessity is laid upon me. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Let's come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17, for if I do this willingly, you know, there are different ways we can do something we have to do. We can do it willingly. We can do it unwillingly. We can do it cheerfully. We can do it with grumbling. We can do it with pleasure. And we can do it unpleasantly. We can do it murmuring. But Paul the Apostle said, I have to do this. And I ought to adjust my mind adjust my heart adjust my will adjust my disposition to what i must do i may go to prison i say i have to be willing i may be persecuted i say i have to be willing i may suffer for the ministry and for the things i do i still have to be willing i cannot retreat 
I cannot go back for if I do this thing, the preaching of the gospel willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, if my will is retreating and going back from it, and internally I'm saying, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to go and preach the gospel? Why should I be the one that the pressure is on to preach to all these people? Why can't other people rise up and do a bit and do a bit so I can do less? And then, even though he was going, he was complaining, he said, if I do that, if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, he realized that there was nothing else he would do. And now he adjusted himself. He said, whatever comes, whatever goes, whoever is a friend, whoever is an enemy, whoever is a helper, whoever is a hindrer, and whoever is a supporter or a persecutor, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, which means whatever happens and whatever does not happen, I will preach the gospel. I pray that will be your mind. That will be your desire. And that will be your perspective in life in Jesus' name. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. And we're reading from verse 23. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. We're reading from verse 23. It tells us in verse 23. It says, Save, except that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and affliction abide me. He said, everywhere I go, he says, there may not be food, but there will be affliction. There may not be friends, but there will be bonds. There may not be pleasure, but there will be bonds and affliction. He says, affliction and bonds abide me, my constant companion, everywhere I go. And yet, look at what he said in verse 24. In verse 24, he says, but none of these things move me. You see, if you do not have commitment, if you do not have consecration and if you are not a responsible person and you're a person that you know likes to flee likes to run away at the slightest difficulty at the slightest danger you will say well i wanted to in fact i was consecrated in church i consecrated myself when i had that message i said that's me i said i'm going to do it but what can I do now? Look at bonds, look at affliction, look at pandemic, and look at difficulty, and look at danger, and look at joblessness, and look at sorrow, and look at sadness, and look at the winds that blow, and look at enemies, and look at the people that don't want me to do it. All right, I wanted to, but since they don't allow me, to freely do it and since they are not encouraging me even the people that should encourage me that the people that stand in the way and say where are you going what are you going to do you want to go there again no you will not and so since they said no i will not my brother what can i do what you should do is to move on and you will move on i said you will move on that's why he said in verse 24 he said but none of these things move me neither count i my life dear unto myself neither count i my life dear unto myself he said so that i might finish my course with joy and the ministry which i have received of the lord jesus to testify to proclaim to preach the gospel of the grace of god he said that is number one suffering doesn't matter bonds doesn't matter affliction 
that doesn't matter or position that's nothing he says the number one thing and the priority that he was committed to is that he will testify the gospel of the grace of god the people in his world and the people in our world they do not understand the grace of god that brings salvation teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly laws and to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world the people in his world and the people in our world they do not know that jesus christ gave himself that he might purify the people and redeem us from all iniquity he said since i have this knowledge and i have this understanding whatever may be happening encouragement or discouragement I will pursue and I will have this prevailing compelling commission to preach the gospel and to testify of the gospel of the grace of God let's come to first Corinthians chapter 9 verse 18 in first Corinthians chapter 9 verse 18 what is my reward then at this present time was my reward and then when i cross over i cross over the jordan of death or i cross over the point of the rapture and then i go to the other side what is my reward then very late that when i preach the gospel have you noticed how many times he's talking about preach the gospel if i preach the gospel if i preach not the gospel preach the gospel very late that when i preach the gospel i me make the gospel of Christ without charge I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that when I preach the gospel when I proclaim the gospel when I declare the gospel I make the gospel without charge you understand is saying I don't want anybody to say that the condition Paul the apostle put on his preaching the gospel to us i can't meet that condition and the money he requests that we contribute before we can hear the gospel from him we don't have that money and because of that we can't hear him and he will not allow us to come to him and hear the gospel not only that the condition of you must do this for me you must do that for me you must appreciate me and you must obey me and you must do this and that all those conditions they're so multiplied and they're so complicated we cannot fulfill that condition because of that we cannot go to hear paul the apostle he said no in my own case and this ought to be in your mind and this ought to be your commitment that you make the gospel of christ without charge you are not charging them money you are not charging them any material thing you are not expecting from them this this and this have you heard of preachers pastors that say well i'm trying to give my best that the sinners there will be saved and that the church will grow and the church will move on onto maturity but because they don't even obey me and they don't accept me and they don't respect me and the little charge i demand of them that they will do this and do this so i can be happy on the job they are not doing that all right you want to perish that's your responsibility i'm going to see now paul the apostle said no not at all i don't put any charge on this I don't put any price on this and there are workers in the church because they don't recognize my position they don't recognize my importance they don't recognize my service okay the charge they put there is that since they don't give me the proper recognition i'm going to see that paul the apostle said that i make the gospel of the lord jesus christ without charge that i abuse not my power my right my privilege my position in the gospel we ought to think about that are you a pastor are you abusing your power your position your authority in the gospel 
Are you a worker? Are you abusing your power, your right, your position in the gospel? Are you trying to put some price on your ministry? If they don't do this, if they don't accept this, then I will not give my best. Paul the apostle said, I know something is committed into my hand and I will do this so that souls will be saved and souls will be matured in the Lord. In Romans chapter 15, we're reading from verse 16. Romans chapter 15 reading from verse 16 it says that i should be the minister of jesus christ to the gentiles ministering the gospel of god ministering not my personal opinion ministering not the tradition of the jews ministering not the philosophy of the greeks ministering not the enlightenment of education ministering the gospel the good news of god that the offering of of the gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified by the holy ghost i pray god will give us that same mind that he gave paul the apostle in jesus name look at first corinthians chapter 10 verse 33 first corinthians chapter 10 we're reading from verse 33 it says even as i please all men in all things even as i please all men in all things what does that mean when he came to the barbarians he spoke in such a way that the barbarians did not feel ashamed that they were barbarians he spoke in a language they will understand when he came to the greeks he spoke at their level that they will understand that he could be at their level when he came to the jews he spoke to them from the old testament scriptures and he said everywhere he went he was not there to please himself it was there to please all men in all things not seeking my own profit not seeking my own promotion not seeking my own pleasure not seeking my own wealth but the profit of many that they may be saved that they may be saved as you go out to preach the gospel as you go out to proclaim the good news of the lord there is one purpose in your mind and there is something you have in your heart that they may be saved because whatever grammar you blow and whatever scriptures you quote and whatever depth of knowledge you exhibit if they are not saved the purpose of preaching is lost it says that's the reason why i'm going out and that's the reason why i'm preaching the gospel i'm not pleasing myself i'm not looking for my own profit i'm not looking for my own pleasure i'm not looking for my own satisfaction but i please all men in all things in all things in all things that they may be saved i pray god will give every one of us that same consecration and commitment in jesus name a good good amen, amen. luke chapter 9 we're reading from verse 23 in luke chapter 9 verse 23 and he said unto them all and jesus said unto all the disciples and he said unto to them all if any man come after me let him deny himself you know if you're going to come after christ and you're going to live like christ lived and you're going to do what christ could have been doing now if christ were here seeking to save the lost if you're going to do anything and you're following after the footsteps of the lord jesus christ you will deny yourself but you know if you just go out i'm a believer I'm a soul winner you cannot even deny yourself you are hungry that is the end of the day 
you are thirsty that's the end of the soul winning and then you have a little hurt on your toe that's the end of outreach any little uh, displeasure and that is the end so and so did not greet me and did not look at me favorably and did not uh, do things maybe they don't even like me and they don't want me to be in their midst a little thing will make you to step back and say i'm not doing it anymore the lord said if you are going to follow him and follow his pattern of life and follow him in evangelization and follow him in everything you have to do you must deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow him look at verse 59 in that chapter in verse 59 and he said unto another follow me and he said unto another follow me but he said lord suffer me first to go and bury my father my father just died and i need to wait behind i was still planning i was still organizing it when i finish and when we've gone through all the rites and ceremonies then i'll think about it and come back in verse 60 it says in verse 60 jesus said unto him let the dead bury their dead but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. That's how important, that's how essential, that's how indispensable the preaching of the gospel is. Let the dead bury their dead. Let, uh, you know, the people who can handle the things in the world, they'll handle it. Whether you are there or you are not there, they might insult you, they might abuse you, they might persecute you because you are not there, but they will do it and you go and preach the kingdom of God in verse 61 in verse 61 and another also said Lord I will follow thee but I will follow thee but there are people that put a but to their consecration a but to their commitment a but to their vow a but to the promise they are making to the Lord another also said Lord, he called him Lord. He said, I accept you as the Lord of my life, as the director of my life, as the controller of my life, and I will follow you. But let me first, let me first, let me first. There are people, they put themselves first. Before the salvation of the people, they are false. And before the restoration of the backslider, their own idea and their own pursuit is false. And before they obey the Lord, what they plan to do, what they want to do, how they are going to make a success of the business of the world, take a job there, take another job there. They want to combine two, three jobs so they can make more money. Me false, he said let me first go bid them farewell which are at home at my house look at verse 62 and jesus said unto him no man no man in that generation or in this generation no man until christ comes no man in the church no man anywhere no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back his feet for the kingdom of God. Just looking back, like Lord's wife, is no more fit for the kingdom of God. If those who look back are no more suitable, are no more acceptable in the kingdom of God, how about those who turn back? How about those who go back? I but those who say I cannot anymore, we cannot be doing evangelism the way we did it. Uh, you know, about 20 years ago, I wasn't married at that time, but now I'm married and now I have children, and now I have to take two jobs and three jobs. I have to make ends meet, and so I cannot continue. Jesus said, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Necessity is laid upon every believer and what is any believer who will stop preaching the gospel because of the challenges of the day and because of the challenges of the time the Lord will grant us understanding and the fire of the Lord and the fire of the Holy Ghost will burn in every heart again in Jesus name 
we will obey the words of Christ. Let's come to point number two now. Point number two is the purposeful, convincing consecration in pursuing his goal. The ace goal. You know, there are many people, uh, they read about uh, business, they read about success, and they read about uh, whatever program or project, and they tell them, uh, do so, uh, lecturing them or training them. If you want to succeed, you want to be a millionaire, there is one essential thing in your life you must set goal, and the goal must be definite, and then you must put that goal as priority if you're going to earn this amount of money it should not be left open-ended you must have a particular target and you must have a date you must say by december 24th here is the amount of money i want to have in the bank in my name and they say when you set that goal you pursue that goal and you don't allow anything religion you don't allow anything church service you don't allow anything evangelism you don't allow anything to conflict with your goal those people are losers they will lose on earth they will lose in eternity we need to pursue his goal the goal of the lord jesus christ the reason why he came and the reason why he brought you into the kingdom and you are in the kingdom at such a time like this not for your goal not for success in the world not for business in the world but for the goal that he himself has and then you pursue that with consecration and you pursue that convincingly and you pursue that purposefully the purposeful convincing consecration in pursuing his goal let's come to first corinthians chapter 9 and we're reading from verse 19 for though i be free from all men yet have i made myself servant unto all that i might gain the more he said i am free free from all men and i could have any goal for myself and i know my constitution and i know my determination and i know my diligence that if i set my heart on anything to target and to get it for myself I will that's the kind of person I am but he said even though I could do that and then forget about the needs of the Gentiles and forget about the salvation of the Jews and forget about the commission the Lord had given me he said though I be free from all men yet have I made myself they are not compelling me no church is making anything compulsory for me. No Corinthian, no Ephesian, no Thessalonian is uh, putting any pressure on me. This is my personal consecration. Yet have I made myself servant unto all. Why? That I might gain more Gentiles, that I might gain more Jews, that I might gain more philosophers and bring them into the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Lord wants every one of us to do. And that is the example that the Lord Jesus Christ has laid. He made himself poor, that through his poverty, ye might be rich spiritually rich and then you might be rich in faith and rich in good works it tells us about the life of jesus in philippians chapter 2 reading there from verse 4 philippians chapter 2 reading there from verse 4 look not every man on his own things my program my project my success my goal, my achievement, my pursuit, my determination, and what I set my mind to have for myself. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. How will others get saved? That's what you look at. 
how will others be established in the kingdom that's what you look at how will others be well discipled for Christ that's what you look at how will others grow and mount up with wings as eagles that's what to look for don't look at what am I going to suffer what pleasure will I need to deny myself of and what could I have had in the world I may not have if I commit myself to this? It says, don't think about yourself. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Look at verse 5. In verse 5 it says, let this mind be in you. Let this mind be in you. Let the mind of Christ be in you. Let the might of the Savior be in you. Let the might of sacrifice be in you. Let this might be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it no trouble to be equal with God. In the form of God, he thought it no trouble to be equal with God. And then in verse 7, it says, but he made himself of no reputation he made himself of no reputation he made himself of no reputation and he says that's the mind that should be in every one of us believers not always seeking my reputation my honor my glory my self-respect my self-esteem you know there are people all they think about is their self-esteem is their self-respect is their self-honor and is how the people of the world how they look at them they think about their dressing will this pump me up and will this present me properly before the people they think of how they carry themselves and they think now if i preach the gospel i stand up in a bus and i'm saying hear the word of god jesus is savior how does that help me how does that improve on my self-esteem? They, they want reputation every time, reputation everywhere. But Jesus Christ made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and being found and was made in the likeness of men. In verse 8, it says, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself the people who are so high nobody can humble them and they will not humble themselves but Jesus Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross and that is the calling we have and that's what Paul the apostle said he said that's why I suffer all things for the salvation of other people second Timothy chapter 2 we're reading from verse 10 in second Timothy chapter 2 reading from verse 10 it says therefore I endure all things I endure all things look up at me here what have you endured of late what abuse what insult what assault and what pressure and what persecution and what suffering and what affliction have you endured of late what have you endured reaching out to sinners what can you say people threw at you and people said of you and people did to you that you endured how you see that in our lives we're not thinking anymore i need to endure i need to endure and you know things might happen from directions you didn't expect things might come from people you didn't expect because of your preaching the gospel and because of your proclaiming the good news of salvation and that is what to endure but if you are always thinking about my dignity if you are always thinking about my personality if you are always thinking my stature 
my education and if you're always thinking my position in the church my position in the world if you're always thinking how can they say that to me how can they address me like that if you're always thinking there's nothing to endure you will not serve the lord properly and you will lose your reward on earth and you will lose your reward in heaven who knows you might even miss heaven but paul the apostle said therefore i endure all things for the elect's sake for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in christ jesus with eternal glory that's the way he wants us to live so that we can help other people to understand that jesus died for them that they cannot save themselves and it is christ only that can save them and whatever we endure for them to come to the knowledge of the salvation of the lord it is worth it that's why he said in first corinthians chapter 9 verse 20 first corinthians chapter 9 reading from verse 20 and unto the jews i became as a jew and unto the jew i became as a jew that i might gain the jews that i might gain the jews what did he mean by that unto the jews i became a jew as a jew when he got to the synagogue he took the scripture that the jews believed that the jews accepted and he read it to them and he explained it to them and he said fathers and brethren this is the word that god spoke to our fathers he identified with them as a jew and what they have written is now fulfilled in the generation of their children and we are those children and eternal life is is provided for us through the Lord Jesus Christ as our prophets have reached unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law I and I always ask them brethren what does the law say that is the law of the Old Testament I go back to that law I open their eyes for them to understand are you a Jew so am I are you of the tribe of whatever so am I of the tribe of Benjamin and then he identified with those Jews so that those Jews will say well look at this man he's talking to us in the language we understand that I might gain them that are under the law that I might gain them that are under the law let's look at at first corinthians chapter 9 verse 21 in verse 21 now he comes to the gentiles and he's going to say something and to them that are without law the gentiles they don't accept the jewish uh, scriptures and they're not under the law of the jewish people and he comes to them because they are heathen and because they are gentiles and he says to them that are without law as without law not being without law to god but on that law to christ he says but i appeal to them i say as i went through your streets i i saw many ensigns and then the final one to the unknown god and that god you said is unknown it's not quoting the scriptures because they need to understand the scriptures he was talking to them in the language they understood and then he will say as one of your poets said as one of your writers said that we live in him and we move in him and we are his offspring and that god that you don't know he has sent a redeemer and there is a day of judgment and all this time of ignorance god winked at but now he commanded all men everywhere to repent when he got to those who did not have the law he appeared 
reveal to them by what they knew that I might gain them that are without law. That I might gain them that are without law. Look at um, Romans chapter Romans chapter 10. We're reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 1, brethren. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. When I go to those Jews, I don't annoy them. I don't contradict them. I don't offend them. I presage the gospel from their own scriptures in, in the way they will understand. To the Jew, I am like a Jew, so that they will be saved. I have concern, my heart's desire, and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Uh, let's turn now to Romans chapter 11, reading from verse 13 and verse 14. Romans chapter 11, and we're reading from verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles, is spoken about the Jews in chapter 10. My heart's desire, my passion, my burden is that the Jews, Israel, might be saved now to the Gentiles. For I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my office. I come to you and here I'm at home. You are Gentiles, and I have already conditioned my mind and my heart, and I tailor the preaching of the gospel to suit you because Christ died for everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world of Gentiles or Jews to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved and so he said i come to you gentiles i am the apostle of the gentiles in verse 14 he says if by any means i may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh you also still remember the jews that as you are getting saved you who are gentiles are provoked to emulation all those people the jewish people who are of my race and might save some of them and might save some of them the important thing is that they may be saved we're coming back to romans chapter 10 and we're looking at at verse 9 Romans chapter 10 verse 9 whether a Jew or Gentile whether Greek or barbarian everyone here is out to get saved that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved in verse 10 it says for what the heart for what the heart man believeth unto righteousness and what the mouth confession is made unto salvation verse 13 in verse 13 for whosoever a jew or a gentile for whosoever a barbarian or greek for whosoever illiterate or philosopher for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved in verse 17 so then faith cometh by hearing faith cometh by hearing and when you are talking to the jews you are not going to say anything that will make them block their ears faith faith for salvation come ahead by hearing when you are talking to the gentiles you're not going to say anything that will make them block their ears against what you are saying because if they're going to be saved they need faith and faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of god i pray that god will give us everything it takes to minister to everybody deny ourselves and make them hear the gospel that will save them in jesus name amen look at now point number three in point number three the proper consuming concern 
for the people of God. Consuming concern. You know, when you have concern, it may be a kind of a superficial concern. It's like when you put water on the, on the kettle and then you put a leech on it. The water might be warm. It will not affect the leech. And then it might become hotter may not affect the lead but when it gets to a particular boiling point and then the steam coming out will throw up the lead that's the kind of zeal we're talking about is zeal a concern a passion that consumes you that you are thinking if this person i talk to every time if this person i see every time at the end of her days, at the end of his days, will go to the other side and spend eternity on the other side. What a pity. What will happen? Because of that, you have a concern, a consuming concern, which is proper for all the people you get in touch with. The proper consuming concern for the people, for the creatures of God. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. It says, To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. By all means save some. Some people are lonely, and the only way the means we can use in getting them to listen to the gospel is getting near and solving the problem of their loneliness. Some people are sick, and they don't have anybody to take care of them, and the only way we can make them listen to anything we say at all is to take care of them and pray for them. Some people are afflicted, and they feel jolted and cheated in life and they say they don't trust anybody anywhere anymore and they're living like a lone ranger and the way we can help them is to get near and diffuse all those thoughts they have in their mind some people are poor and they do not have anything wherewithal they'll take care of themselves and the only way will get their attention is to provide for some of their material some people are are so religious and they are dead and buried in their religion and the only way we can get to them is to be interested in them and ask them questions i see that you are very religious i see that you are very devoted i really appreciate your kind of devotion and now he's going to open up and tell you why is that religious the religion of their father the religion in their family why is committed to to that and as he now talks is able to open up and is going to ask you how about you what do you think of religion and you say well you know religion is a way of man trying to find god and there are many many religions but you know i don't like to talk about religion they're just uh, trying to find god but they're not finding god i want to talk to you about righteousness god is righteous he doesn't think of religion and the only way you can please the lord is to have the righteousness of christ the perfect one and it can transfer that to your account huh, how can that happen when well, you get him talking you get him also to listen to the weak i am as weak that i might gain the weak i am made all things to all men all things to all men the educated people all they're looking for in life is i must be happy i want to be happy and you you confront them and you say oh, what's the this happiness happiness let's talk about it how do you define happiness and they say you know if i have all the money that i really want and i get this and i get that i will be happy and you say what if you had all the money in the world and then your wife feels neglected and abandoned 
will you be happy what if you had all the money in the world and your children are not taken care of and your children are saying daddy daddy we miss you if you have less money and we have more of you we will be happy this will be a good family if you travel here travel there and you have all this popularity and then internally you are empty what will happen to you have you have you heard of many millionaires that kill themselves and commit suicide because life is empty for them you get to them you make them understand that what they are pursuing in life doesn't amount to anything at all and because you know people you know their heart you know their mind and you know what they are seeking for and then you say I am made all things to all men I'm at home with everybody I can interact with them I can talk to them the purpose is that I might by all means save some it might be some people don't they say I don't have any time I, I can't listen to any kind of preaching now um, after this I'm um, after that you have their number you send the message to them and you send the message to the platform they will understand they will read and then they will be brought under conviction by all means whatever you can do preach the gospel to them and let them have the gospel that will change their lives and transform them i pray as we do that the lord will get hold of many people and they will come to know the lord as their personal savior in jesus name give me a good good amen and let's come to hebrews chapter 2 hebrews chapter 2 we're reading from verse 3 hebrews chapter 2 reading from verse 3 how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation how shall we escape how will you escape if you have all the knowledge of the bible but you neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him if you are born again and your acquaintances and your friends and your co-workers and your co-tenants are not born again you cook in the same kitchen your bath in the same bathroom and you are very familiar yet you never tell them about salvation how shall they escape if they abandon if they reject if they neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Salvation is available for everyone and eternal life is available for the Jew, for the Gentile, for you, for your friends and for everybody. But you must take a step and accept because in Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9, Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9 the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness the lord is not slack he said christ will come why is why has he not come he said the rapture is imminent it can happen anytime from any moment from now why has it not happened the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long suffering towards what? Long suffering not only toward one person, towards what? Your dad, your mom, towards what? Your children, your daughter, your son, towards what? Your friends and your neighbors, towards what? The Lord is long suffering towards what? Not willing that any should perish. When you have the same mind as God, the same mind as Christ, and you're not willing that anybody should perish, you'll talk to them, you'll let them, you will tell them the good news of salvation. You'll tell them no matter how good they think they are, there is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved is only the name of Jesus they must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ before they and their household can be saved that is what will happen that they will not perish because God is not willing that any shall perish but that all shall come 
to repentance. All shall come to repentance. It tells us in Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. The grace of God that bringeth salvation is all by grace. Jesus Christ has paid the price. He has shed the blood. And now all the people need is the information. All that the people need is the revelation that Jesus Christ has provided salvation. And they will not have that revelation except you tell them, except you proclaim, except you publish the good tidings, the gospel of the Lord. For the gospel of God that bringeth salvation if you're preaching the gospel the way of salvation must be very clear repent believe on the lord and hold him as the only one that can save you the grace of god that brings salvation has appeared to all men in verse 12 it says teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust if they're going to be saved that's important they deny ungodliness they reject ungodliness they abandon unrighteousness they turn away from all occultism and from all paths of darkness teaching us that grace of God that brings salvation that appears to you that appears to me that appears to the people you are talking to and you're revealing the mind of God to that grace of God that brings salvation teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws we should to live soberly when that salvation enters when we have that salvation we become real children of God transformed and changed and become new creatures in Christ we should now live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world we live that life that shows that Christ has entered the Savior has taken control of our lives and the Savior is now in charge of our lives it says in verse 13 looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ in verse 14 who gave himself is paid the price it's done everything there is to do he has satisfied the demand of the Heavenly Father and all your sins and all their sins have been placed on Christ and because he has borne the punishment of everyone and the punishment for sin for one sin for any sin cannot be paid double and the punishment cannot be paid two times if he has paid the price if he has given himself and now salvation is available all they have to do your friends all they have to do your relations all they have to do your neighbors all they have to do the people you are preaching the word of God to all they have to do is to accept Jesus Christ who is their substitute who has borne the punishment for them and then when they are born again they also receive him now as the sanctifier and the purifier he has done everything there is to do he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself and purify unto himself unto himself they don't get saved and remain on the field they don't get saved and remain in the wilderness they don't get saved and remain in the world they come to him they abide in him because he pardons them to bring them unto himself he purifies them he sanctifies them to bring them unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works and as we go out and reach out to people and we show them that everything God should have done for the salvation of humanity he has done will bring them to decision that they will decide and invite Jesus into their hearts and receive the salvation of the Lord we show them in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 reading from verse 2 2 Corinthians 
chapter 6 reading from verse 2 for he says i have heard thee in a time accepted and in the day of salvation have i succored thee behold now is the accepted time behold now is the day of salvation all the people we contact will make them to understand and some of them might say this is a street this is a street road can i get saved here now is the day of salvation or it may be in their own house do i need to follow you to church and then in church i repent in church i'll get saved here you can get saved here now is the day of salvation we don't know what may happen tomorrow therefore you are not going to allow anybody to say i'll wait another time i'll wait another opportunity behold now is the day of salvation the word is in your mouth and as you go out and proclaim that gospel that good news like paul the apostle like the lord jesus christ like the apostles of the lord jesus as they did it and many people turned unto the lord you will do it many will turn to the lord in jesus name and they went forth preaching the word and the lord confirming the word was signs following the lord will go with you the lord will be with you and the people you talk to the spirit of god will take the words you speak and bring them to conviction bring them to repentance and bring them to faith in christ and bring them to salvation in jesus name you will not go empty-handed when you go to meet the lord jesus christ he has sent you so send i you and you'll go with the word of salvation to everyone you meet in jesus name let's rise up now and talk to the lord in prayer let's rise up we've heard a lot like paul the apostle did it in his own time let's pray that the zeal to do it the commitment to do it the consecration to do it and the consuming passion the consuming concern to do it the lord will grant every one of us in jesus name